Would you stand, please, as we open our Bibles this morning to 1 Samuel 17, and we're going to read beginning in verse number 1, and today we're going to bring a message entitled, Overcoming Fear. We have been in a series looking at the lives of men such as Moses and uh, Abraham and a woman like Jochebed. Today we're going to look at the life of David, and we're going to learn how we face the giants of this life. Next Sunday, I'll be bringing a message that uh, is entitled Overcoming Depression. We're going to see a man of God named Elijah under a juniper tree wishing that life would end. And uh, if you've struggled with some discouragement or depression or you know someone is uh, who is, I want to encourage you, bring them to Lancaster Baptist. The reason we name these series, the reason we're announcing these titles and giving them out, out front is so we can invite friends who would benefit and grow and be saved as a result of hearing the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so today, how to overcome the fears of this life, 1 Samuel 17:1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shokah, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shokah and Azekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on, the side, on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, who, whose height was six cubits and a span, and had a an helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye the servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall, be, then, then, uh, shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines, the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed, and say it with me, greatly afraid greatly afraid. Let's pray together. Father, we live in the land of the greatly afraid. And we ask today that as Christians, you would give us an infusion of the power and the courage and the strength of David of old. We pray that you would help us, even though we face tumultuous times, to know that you are in control, to rest in your sovereignty and to believe that you have a plan through all of the things that we face, that your plan is unfolding. So give me strength and power and fill each of us with your spirit. And if there are those without Christ in their life this morning, unsure of a home in heaven, I pray that they would open their heart today and receive Jesus Christ. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Fear is one of the most powerful of all the human emotions. Fear can develop into anxiety, which can become debilitating and oftentimes require even medical assistance. Suddenly, circumstances can come into our lives where our hearts are gripped with fear for a day or a week or months, sometimes leading to adrenal failure, sometimes leading to psychosis, Fear is an amazingly powerful emotion that many Americans are experiencing today. Many people are living in a state of fear today. As the government tries to do what they think is helpful, they many times create panic in the minds of people along with the help of the media in this very hour. Many people live in a state of fear. Regarding inflation, they're concerned about the power of their dollar. 
regarding the military threat of China and what might happen in Taiwan. These are concerns to some today. Many today have fear of getting the vaccination and others have fear of not getting the vaccination. There's the fear of COVID and there's the fear of a government's overreach. And by the way, uh, as your pastor, I'm not a fan of governmental mandates, just for the record. These things many times bring the fear of how much more control will be exerted over God's people or over the average citizens. And what I'm saying is that all of the things that are in the news today, all of the mandates and all of the medical things, and even those things that are given with well intention, may I say to you that many times the bottom result is someone at home living in fear of what might happen to them. It is a constant emotion that is experienced today. Now, 381 times in the Bible, we read two amazing words, and those words are fear not. Would you say that with me? Fear not. These were the words that had to be given even to great Christians and wonderful people of God, such as Mary, the mother of our Lord, and so many others. They had to receive the words fear not. Now, all of us from time to time need to hear those words, fear not. You may be planning uh, something in this week, perhaps a doctor's appointment, perhaps some challenge that you're facing. And I want you to know that if it is God's will for you to go through this experience, that his desire is that you would fear not. He wants to be with you. He has promised that he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. I heard about one fellow that after enlisting in the 82nd Airborne Division, he went to his uh, recruiter and he said, all right, he said, now tell me about jump school. What's jump school going to be like? He said, well, it's three weeks long. The young man said, well, what else? He said, well, the first week we separate the men from the boys. He said, all right, what about the second week? He said, oh, that's when we separate the men from the fools. He said, okay, what about the third week? He said, that's when the fools jump. (laughs) Now, I don't know about you, but if I was in the 82nd Airborne, that would bring great fear to my heart. I'm just going to be honest with you. I hear about some of these guys for their 70th or 80th birthdays, and they jump out of of an airplane to celebrate uh, their birthday. I'll be just fine with some German chocolate cake on the couch, all right? I don't need to jump out of a plane to get excited about my birthday. But I'm saying that if you're not experiencing a challenge today, there will come points in your life when fear grips your heart. And today we see how David, a shepherd boy, overcame fear, even when many people much stronger than him were dismayed and greatly afraid. For those of you that have ever studied a little bit about the Philistines, you'll know that they were known not only for their warlike nature and their giant size, but also for the fact that they had a monopoly on the iron production during this year, uh, of which we study now, around 1200 BC. They had a monopoly on the iron production and they were able to import, smelt, and forge this iron to make various military weapons. And this was simply added to their military prowess, their ability to create uh, various uniforms, swords, spears uh, that they could use in battle. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 13, 19, now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock. In other words, all of the tools that uh, were made and sharpened, all of this was controlled by the Philistines. And this made them a formidable enemy to the children of God. And so here we see this morning the Philistines and the children of Israel in the array of war. We see them in a situation that was extremely fearful, even for the mightiest soldiers of Israel. And I want you to notice that with me this morning. Notice, first of all, the paralysis of fear. Fear has a way of just stopping forward motion. Fear has a way of causing us to simply uh, stop in our, in our place and not know what to do next. 
And the Bible tells us that there is a great gathering of Israel. We see this gathering in verses 1 through 3. And the Bible tells us that they come to this place of battle, uh, this valley of Elah. This was a buffer zone between the Philistines and Israel. And uh, when you look at this valley of Elah, it is in a place called Shephelah. It is a place that uh, is not far from uh, Gaza and not far from Jerusalem, about a midway point. And the Gaza Strip area was the habitation during this time of some of the, Philipp- uh, some of the Philistine cities. And, and so they would gather there uh, in this area which led out of the hill country from Bethlehem over to the coast near Ashdod and other such cities. There were five Philistine cities. And this was the area that divided uh, their territory from the territory toward Jerusalem. Now, if the Philistines got past Israel in Elah, they would be able to go directly to Jerusalem and bring great havoc. And so it was that they were there in the battle of Array uh, in the valley of Elah. And this valley Uh, is a place that you can visit even today. In fact, uh, we were there several years ago. I think I have a picture of our family there. And every time we stop somewhere, we open the Bible. This is what you do on a Holy Land trip. You open the Word of God and you read what took place there. And so this is our daughter, Christine, reading uh, from 1 Samuel chapter 17. You'll notice Terry so intently listening to the Word of God. Do you see that right there? She's just so intently listening to the Word of God. But I want you to notice in her hand right here. Can you see this right here? This is a common baggie from the Target store right here. It's not a Holy Land artifact. I want to tell you about that because when we were there at the Valley of Elah, we got the idea and uh, uh, we, are, we, we had a, a bus driver and a guide. We were the only group there at the time. I said, you know, I'd love to have a few of these stones uh, to put on a plaque and give as gifts to some folks and just to really go into the Valley of Elah to walk in where uh, David would have chosen his five stones. I thought, wow, that would be great. And so uh, I I got a few stones like that and uh, had them. And and Terry thought, well, I would love to have them for my Sunday school class and my college class and my aunts and uncles. I'm not sure who else. And before I knew it, there was one bag and another bag and Christine was delegated and Danielle was delegated and we were in the Valley of Elah enjoying the moment and it was fine they grabbed these bags full it was all fine until it was time to leave the country of Israel and we were going through the bag check area and as they were opening up all of the bags there they had two or three soldiers trying to lift my wife's suitcase they opened the suitcase And they began to talk in Hebrew, and they were talking about the suitcase and all that was in the suitcase. And and, uh, finally, a man came over to Terry and I in English, and he said, do you have permission from the Department of Archaeology to remove these assets from our country? I said, we have permission from our tour guide. (laughs) And uh, we tried to give him his name. They didn't know. And uh, folks, I want you to know that it's only by the grace of God that your pastor's wife is not in prison at this very moment (laughs) for stealing stones from the Valley of Elah. But the battlefield is a real place, and there was a tremendous array of soldiers that were gathered on either side. And then there were these battle plans that had been made. Notice in verse 2 it says, And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah, and the battle in array. They set the battle in array. What does that mean, the word array? It means to arrange or to place in order. Saul was arranging and setting up plans for this battle. This may have taken several days uh, to plan and then to establish the encampments of these soldiers. There's only one problem with what we're reading in the scripture today, and that is what is left out. And that is the fact there is no indication that Saul ever sought the Lord regarding the array of the battle. There's no indication that he sought the Lord with respect to his strategy. How often have I said over the years from this pulpit, never make a major decision in your life during a discouraging, depressing time. And when you need to make a major decision in your life, seek the Lord, seek his word, seek godly counsel. You see, Saul was a self-willed man. Saul was making decisions on his own. But man's best laid plans will fail without God's guidance without God's direction. 
Tonight I will preach one of the most important messages I've preached, I think, in many years. It's a message from 1 John chapter 4 on learning to try the spirits to see whether they be of God. How can we have discernment in this day? Saul was not acting with godly discernment. The Spirit of God had now left him, and he was living in a way that could only be described as a fleshly pattern. In fact, David had already been anointed as king. Saul is a picture now of the fleshly man making decisions on his own. We see the gathering of Israel in the valley of Elah. But notice, secondly, the champion of the Philistines. The Bible tells us in verse Number four, there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Here we see this Goliath, and what is he doing? He's doing what Satan always does with God's people. He is intimidating the people of God. He's shouting at them. He's defying them. He's using the name of their God in vain as he speaks to the armies of Israel. Goliath's name, interestingly, means splendor. From the standpoint of the world, this nine-foot-six giant of a man was a glorious person to behold. Splendor. Goliath standing there shouting against the people of God, wearing his helmet of brass, his coat of mail, literally a breastplate made of iron scales to protect him. Uh, the greaves of brass to cover his legs, and, and then his spear, the spearhead weighing approximately 18 pounds. I'm telling you, this man was a strong and a giant man. He is there as an intimidating presence. He is there as a defying presence. I want you to notice in verse number eight, the Bible says, he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said to them, why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. Here we see he is defiant in his spirit. In fact, in verse 10, it says, and the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. I want to simply say this morning as we get into this message that if you ever intend to be in the battle of the Lord, Satan will defy you. Satan will try to intimidate you. He will criticize a woman who is a woman of God. He will criticize a man who is a man of God. He will criticize a church that stands against the sins of the day. And this was the spirit of Goliath to bring a a defiant call against God's people. Today, we see in the media defiance. We see the encroachment more and more. You cannot watch a television commercial during the upcoming holiday season without seeing uh, perversion of every kind, even on the commercials. You cannot help but listen to the news or, or or read the paper without seeing that society is defiant against the things of God. Oh, it was 40 years ago they tore down the Ten Commandments, but now uh, they want to silence anyone that would declare the name of Jesus Christ. And so there is a defiant attitude from the world throughout history. But notice not only the gathering of Israel, the champion of the Philistines, but notice the fear of the leaders of Israel. The Bible says in verse number 11, when Saul and all of Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now I want you to understand the depth of this. The Bible uses the word dismayed, and this is what it means. To be shattered or to be broken. To be shattered or to be broken. Now, when Satan is speaking out against the people of God, when the Philistine giant is defying the people of God, this is not the time for Christians to be shattered or broken. Saul is a fleshly man at this point, worried, greatly afraid, full of fear. And that was now coming down into the ranks of his army. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 23. The Bible says, And he talked with them, and behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath by name, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. And David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him, and were sore afraid. This went on for 40 days and 40 nights. 
Fear was building and mounting to the place of paranoia and anxiety to the place that no one even wanted to get into the battle. Many times today we see people in our society willing to march in the streets and even burn private property and to face police cars and they're bold and we see these uh, hoodlums as they even embark upon the idea of disrupting worship and, and intimidating people praying in the parks or praying near their churches or on their college campuses and yet many times Christians are afraid to pass out a gospel tract. Afraid to speak out for what is right. Afraid to stand up for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what I want you to recognize is that this type of timidity is not necessarily the will of God. That this is oftentimes indicative of a very shallow spiritual life. I'm not advocating rebel rousing or some kind of uh, a demonstration in the flesh. But I am saying too many times... As the world needs answers, the church is silent, and we do not speak up with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And these men were afraid with the paralysis of analysis. Fear spreads when no one is willing to speak out and say what is right. I heard the story of a summer night when a severe sun thunderstorm was taking place and a mother was tucking her, her son into bed. And she was about to turn the light off when he asked with a trembling voice, Mommy, will you stay in here with me tonight? Mommy, please stay. Smiling, the mother gave him a warm, reassuring hug and said tenderly, I, I can't stay in here tonight, honey. I, I, I'm sleeping in the other room with Daddy tonight. A long silence broke, and his little shaky voice said, The big sissy. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you something. It may be a thunderstorm at night that bothers you. It may be something else. But we must never let fear grip and control our hearts. One of the most important verses we're going to study this morning is in your notes. I want you to see it there. 2 Timothy 1.7, it says this, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Would you say that together with me now? Ready, begin. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You understand that there are things to be respected. I don't think you should take a verse like this and do crazy things that are damaging to your health. That's not what it's speaking about. But it's telling us that it is not the will of God that we would live in fear or depression or discouragement because God has not given us that spirit. That spirit did not come from God. Saul with his trembling and these soldiers with their fearfulness. This was not God in them. This was the flesh. This was men relying upon themselves. And God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. But notice not only the paralysis of fear that is very obvious with the children of Israel. Notice, secondly, the potential of faith. Notice here the potential of faith. Now, what I believe about fear and faith is very simple, and it's founded in the Scripture. That is that fear will always cancel faith, or faith will always cancel fear. One or the other is happening in your life today. Either your fear is canceling out your faith, or your faith is going to cancel out your fear. And I want you to see here the potential of faith, a lesson from David. First of all, as you look at David's life, you're going to learn that he was faithful in the little things. He was faithful in little things. When Saul went to battle, uh, the Bible tells us that David is commanded by his father to take supplies to the battle. Notice in verse 15, the Bible says, and David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep to Bethlehem. So here we see that David is uh, a shepherd boy doing the will of his father. Notice verse 16 says, and the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. And Jesse said unto David his son, take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these 10 loaves and run to the camp to thy brethren and carry these 10 cheeses unto the captain of their thousand and look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. I want you to learn this principle today 
that if we're going to have the faith that pleases God, we must learn to be obedient in the small things first. David submitted to his father. Now, David had already been anointed to be the next king of Israel. David could have said, what am I doing watching these animals? What do you mean, take this over here and give some bread to the soldiers? David could have become rather impatient this way. Uh, David could have uh, had an attitude, if you will, about running these little errands. But God was still developing his faith muscle. God was still developing his life. David could have had friends that would have said, well, how come you have to do this kind of stuff? I mean, doesn't he know who you are and how powerful you are? But David humbly developed his faith through obedience. Often God will put us in a position of obscurity, out of the sight of men, in order to prepare us for the greater battles to come. And I've often found over the years that when someone becomes fleshly or pushy because they didn't get certain position or certain accolades, it's probably a good thing that they did not receive those accolades. Because there is a timing in this matter of battle. There was a time that would be right for David to arise in the eyes of these people of Israel. And that timing would be exactly according to God's timetable, not according to David's timetable. And every one of us today, young people in particular, remember that obedience in the little small areas is not a light thing to God. That God is using those times to prepare you for the greater battles. Remember in Matthew 6, in verse 6, the Bible says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. How many of you believe God saw David faithfully tending to that flock of his father? Amen? God saw that. And God sees you where you are in your life today. God sees your heart. God sees uh, your response and, and David obeyed his father. He was sent to the battle by Jesse to deliver these supplies. And all of us must learn to trust in the timing of God. And if there's a connector in our series, Overcomers, whether it is with Abraham or Moses or Jochebed or now with David, one of the commonalities of all of these great people is that they had patience and that they were willing to wait on the leading of God to bring them to the place of his desired haven. David was faithful in the little. And because of that, secondly, he was faith-filled for the battle. He was faith-filled for the battle. You see, as, as David saw God working a little bit at a time, there was something building in him. There was an understanding of God building in his heart. And this was a heart of faith that was being developed. Notice what happens now as we look at verse 24. It says, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were so afraid. Now fear only sees the obstacles. Fear often makes the obstacle look bigger than it really is. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Fear oftentimes focuses on on the obstacle. But faith sees the victory as always possible through God. Notice in verse 26, the Bible says, And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? Here we see David's view. David's view is that no one should defy the living God, that no one should speak against his God. And so we see that there is a heart of faith in this young man, David, a heart that has been developing through previous circumstances. And he is baffled by the fact that even his older brothers are fearful and waiting on the sideline. He says no one should be allowed to speak this way about God. May I say to you, by the way, it ought to grieve your heart when someone takes the name of your Lord in vain. It's not wrong to ask them to refrain from that. It ought to grieve your heart when some unbiblical policy is presented or some 
uh, show on television is featuring sinful lifestyles, it's okay to write and give your Christian viewpoint on the matter. It's okay to reflect and to speak out as David did. David's just saying the obvious. Nobody should be cursing our God. Sadly, he had to say that to his older brethren. Here we see the heart of David's faith. But we also see that this faith is going to be tested. You see, if you intend to speak up for the Lord, you're going to find sometimes someone's going to speak out against you. Notice what happens in verse 28. The Bible says here, And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why come, camest thou down thither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Eliab is David's oldest brother, and he's questioning David's motives. And I'm going to tell you that when you intend to live for God, to pray for the Thanksgiving meal, to pass out a gospel tract, to speak up for righteousness, there will always be someone questioning your motives. There will always be someone saying, well, he's just doing that to get attention. Well, he's just off in that religious uh, tangent. Well, he, he's always been this way. And sometimes discouragement in my life in ministry, for nearly 40 years of preaching now and uh, 35 years of pastoring, it's even other Christians that try to determine the motive of your heart. And this was the case. It was a family member, Eliab. What are you doing, David? What are you trying to prove, David? Go back and take care of dad's sheep. You don't need to be out here making us look bad. The Bible says in Proverbs 27 and verse 4, wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? Now listen, I don't know what God will put on your heart, and I don't know what Goliath you are facing today, but if you attempt to do something for God, expect others to question your motives. Expect others to come against you and speak against you. Vision often attracts criticism. Oh, I'm telling you, there will be those, if you say, I'm, gonna, I'm praying God will let me lead so many to Christ. I'm praying God will let me give uh, to the building program. I'm praying God will use me to raise a godly family. Whatever you determine to do for good and for God, someone will question your vision. And I want to encourage you this morning. Sometimes vision makes people feel as though they're losing control or, they're, or that something weird is going on in your life. And this is what David experienced. But David's answer was very simple. Is there not a cause? Can I ask that question this morning? Is there not a cause? What was the cause in David's life? It was the name of God. What is the cause today in our lives? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the name of our God, the glory of God. Yes, there's a cause even in this land, America. There is a cause today, and we are seeing today many situations that would tell us that there are those who are denigrating our freedom and speaking out against our God and denigrating our faith. And yes, it's time for Christian people to speak up for the name of the gospel, for the power of the Word of God, and for our Lord Jesus Christ. The cause was too great. Uh, to, be inti to, to intimidate David away from doing the right thing. Our cause is fundamentally surrounding the gospel and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is why freedom does matter. We want the freedom to pass gospel tracts. We have been granted the freedom uh, by our Constitution to speak out concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to cherish those freedoms and defend those freedoms so that we can continue speaking out in the public square. 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And so David had this heart, this heart of faith, but he also faced, it a, a, faced a test against that faith. And then I want you to notice another test that David faces, and that's the test of doubt. Not only is he going to be criticized by his brother, but notice in verse 32, the Bible says this, and David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with the Philistine. Now, how many of you just love this right here? Imagine this 17-year-old boy walking up to Saul, head and shoulders above all the men of Israel, and saying, Saul, don't let your heart fail. I'm going to take care of this. 
How could that be? Could it be that David was a man after God's own heart? Could it be that David's confidence was not in himself? His confidence was in the Lord. Oh, what a tremendous testimony of faith. And as we see David coming to Saul, verse 33 says that Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and, and he a man of war from his youth. Saul doubted David's ability. You see, fear and insecurity will always try to talk us into settling for lesser things. Saul had already settled. Saul had already decided, I'm not going to fight this giant. Saul was looking for a way to somehow wait this out, to get out of the battle. It takes courage to go forward. It takes courage to stand up for what you believe. And we see in this moment the potential of faith. We see faith in a young man like that young man that gave his loaves and fishes to Jesus, like the widow that gave what she could to Jesus. Faith is always what pleases God. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. Well, we see the paralysis of fear, the potential of faith. But notice finally, the path of finality. The path of finality. The path to final victory begins with the first step of faith. The path the final victory begins with the first step of faith. And I want you to see how this step of faith takes place in David's life. Notice, if you would, that there was confidence in a proven means. There is confidence in a proven means. The Bible tells us in verse 34, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a, a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor and essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. Now here we see the necessity of proven means. David had a confidence in the Lord because of past victories. God had done great things for him. God delivered David from two life-threatening battles. He allowed David to destroy not only the lion, but also the bear. And David had learned from these previous battles that God would give him the victory. You see, our faith grows after each battle that we've experienced. And may I say to you this morning that if there is a church in the United States of America that can look ahead with confidence, it is the Lancaster Baptist Church. And I say that partly because we can look back and we can see that God has brought us through battle after battle after battle after building program after building program. How many of you understand this morning? We serve a great God this morning who has done great things. Romans 5 and 3, only not, only not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulations worketh patience and patience a hope and experience hope. And God is allowing these trials in our lives, these experiences in our lives, so that we will be prepared for the greater battles ahead. Listen, God does not waste trials in your life. He is only preparing you. And these were the means of God's preparation. Past victories Warren Wiersbe wrote, God had tested David privately with a lion and a bear. Now he was to test him openly with a giant. If we are faithful in the private battles, God will see us through the public testings. Too often, God's people faint at the smallest test that comes their way, little realizing that the little tests are but preparation for the bigger battles that are sure to come. And so we see here that the past victories uh, were simply times of preparing David for future battles. But then also there was the proven means. David knew that there were certain methods that God would bless. Did you see that Saul gave David his armor. Don't you love this part of the story? 
Saul says, all right, David, if you're going to go out there, let me give you my armor. Let me give you my coat of armor. And David tried to go. The text indicates he couldn't even somehow walk or get out of Saul's presence before he had to say, I have not proved this. I, I've not proven this coat of mail. I've, I can't even walk with this uh, armor on me. And so in verse 40, it says, he took his staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip, in his sling, in his hand, and drew near the Philistine. Now I want you to think of this for just a moment. David used the same method to fight as he had in the past. God had given him a method. And, and he said to Saul, I, I can't go out with your armor. I'm going to go out with what God has blessed in my life. Over my 35 years of pastoring here, I've had so many people try to give me their method or some carnal method for building the church. And, and many times people said, well, you ought to have less preaching. You ought to have more of this and just kind of a you know, laid back culture. And you know, people today, they don't want to have preaching like that. They don't want to have church on a Sunday night. You got to give people what they want. Let me just remind you of what God has blessed at Lancaster Baptist Church. And it started yesterday morning at nine o'clock with men on their knees in prayer and at 9.30 with men with shoe leather going out and telling people about Jesus Christ and this morning with God's people singing the old hymns of the faith and giving tithes and offerings unto the Lord and believing in Jesus Christ as our Savior. This is not the time to try Saul's method or some worldly method for the church. This is the time to say prayer and soul winning and preaching and Bible classes and discipleship are still blessed by God. They are biblical means and we must go forward doing God's work in God's way. And David was told by Saul, try it this way, David. Try it my way. But David had been prepared of God in a way and in a method that had been blessed by God. So many today are treating the Christian life and the church itself as, as if it's their little experiment rather than saying, I want to do God's work God's way. He had confidence in the proven means of God. Confidence in the proven means of God. I literally fear today for some of my young pastor friends because what they are trying in their ministry is nothing more than an experimentation. They are in the ministry. Only time will tell if their own children are even in church 20 years from now. All of the new methodologies, all of the uh, ways of so-called worship, all of the different ideas of so-called ministry that are nothing more than a worldly approach, many times downgrade what could have been a great spiritual movement in the life of these young people. Let us be a church that simply follows the Word of God in our proven means of ministry. But notice not only the confidence in proven means, but more than that, there was a confidence in the person of God. I want you to see this as we close. Notice, if you would, in verse 41, the Bible says, And the Philistine came and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and a fair countenance. May I just pause to draw the analogy? The world in which we live disdains Christians who believe that Jesus Christ is the only way. The world in which we live disdains an assembly like this. No doubt by the time this single message gets out on the internet and on the radio, I'll receive who knows how many letters or emails or messages complaining, cursing, speaking against even this truth of David and Goliath. The world disdains the church today. And Goliath is speaking out and making fun of David. Verse 43, And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with the sword and with the spear and with the shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. 
David is trusting in the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is our strong tower, Proverbs 18 and 10. The righteous runneth to it and is safe. And I don't know what you're up against today, whether it's medical, whether it's something from the society, whether it's witnessing to a friend, whether it's standing for what is right, but run to the tower, the name of the Lord, and trust in his name and recognize there is power in the name of Jesus Christ today. <laughs> there is power in the name of the Lord. The Bible says, in verse 47, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and with spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted. Hey, we need some teenagers today. Instead of lingering in the shadows, instead of running away from times like soul winning and serving, listen, we need to get out in the forefront, young people, and run toward the battle, and run to what God would have us to do, and stand for the Lord. And thank God for many of the teenagers of our church today who are working in bus ministry, who are going out soul winning, who are living godly lives. And I want you as, as a church family, when you see them, encourage them. How many of you believe we need more Davids in this society? David ran to the battle. He wasn't looking to hide from the battle. The Bible tells us that as he ran to the battle, verse 49, he put his hand in his bag and he took thence a stone and slang it. I like that word right there. That's a Southern word, isn't it? He slang it. And he smote the Philistine in his forehead, and the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. I'm telling you what, uh, this, was a, this was like a guided missile right into the forehead of Goliath. And David simply doing what he knew to do, something, something that God had proven in his life. And God gave the victory. And I want to remind you today, there are plenty of giants that we face, but God will give the victory. First John 4 and 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. And David stood there before Goliath in the loving acceptance of his God, in the power of the presence of God. And he slung that rock, and that rock did the rest, God guiding it, and mighty Goliath fell down to the ground, and the finality of his faith was seen when Goliath fell and was beheaded, and the Philistines were destroyed. Why? Because of a young man who had great faith in his God. How about it, some of you police officers, construction workers, aerospace workers? It's okay to pray for your lunch. It's okay to invite a friend to church. It's okay not to laugh at their filthy joke. It's okay to speak out for Jesus Christ. Don't be intimidated by the Goliaths around you. Stand up for the Lord. Don't let fear grip your heart. Don't be stuck in the paralysis of analysis. But as God leads you, run to the battle. Stand in the battle. Speak for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will bless and keep you. And then I love this verse, 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love. You know, the Bible is very clear that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Many people fear the thought of this life ending. Many people do not have the hope that there's a place called heaven. There's not a person here who wants life to end, but God does not want us to face that thought with fear because his perfect love casts out fear. He wants us to have assurance that one day we'll be with him. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 13, these things have I written unto these, unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have everlasting life. God says, I want you to know my love. I want you to find assurance in my love. I want you to be settled in my love. And if you don't have assurance about God's love today, if you don't have assurance that you have a home in heaven, let God's love cast out that fear of eternity without him. There is a God in heaven who sent his son to die for your sin so that your sin could be covered. He rose up again so that you could be with him someday. And if you live with a fear of your eternal destiny, let me encourage you today. Trust Christ as your savior. Let that fear be taken away by the power of the gospel.